Okay, here we go. So this is, welcome back. This is my day 11. I'm beginning to lose track myself. Uh, let's get my speed up a bit. Keeping my incline on zero because it seems to be less squeaky. You'll be fascinated to know. So here I am for my many new listeners and my multitude of old listeners, uh, redoing Camino de Santiago on my treadmill. February 2021, I first did it in 2017, following a video by BK Lee from Korea, who did it in September 2018. I'm on his day three, and I'm on my, sorry, I'm on, yes, I'm on his day three, and I'm on my day 11. So there you go, up to speed, and uh, still haven't calculated how many of these I need to do to finish. If it was a whole Camino, it would be at the speed up to 200 hours. Uh, with his, following his, he doesn't video everything. It's at least a hundred of these, so plenty of, uh, plenty of mate to get your teeth into, as we say in Ireland. Mate, translation meat for my non-Irish listeners. Anyway, touched on something yesterday. Uh, oh yes, yeah, so today I ended up, I have to say, Sunday, listening to Radio 4. Oh, I need my bloody phone, hold on. I keep forgetting to carry my phone as my step counter. Regular listeners will be aware of this. Um, it's a lot of dramatic jeopardy involved with that. So let me get this on my arm. Because I need to hit if I, 150 heart points this week. And I should do it by the end of this session. If I play my cards right. So there we go. Phone strapped on. Uh, in silent mode, of course. So anywho, back again. So yeah, yesterday, so okay, BK is just walking up a lane, looking a little overcast, a little washed out actually, it's just a laneway, quite narrow, with uh, sort of overgrowth or bushes on each side. Jubiri to Laraswana. This sort of reminds me of my possibly the start of my day three. I'm not really sure where he is in relation to me. A lot of this looks the same. The big hills are over, though not completely, but the Pyrenees is over, the big climb. So anyway, the, the last, the biggest climb after this is uh, coming into Galicia, I think, at the end. But yeah, yesterday, oh yeah, so today it's like, what time is it? just after 6 p.m. So I started the day listening to Radio 4. When I wake up early on a Sunday, which usually means I haven't had a, you know, good enough sleep, but they have a program at like just after 6 a.m. called Something Understood. I love that program. Today they were talking about um, the wilderness years. It was Samira Ahmed, who some might know from, she's well known in the UK anyway, from BBC and also laterally of Channel 4 News. Uh, she was great talking about, and I guess it all fit into the whole Lenten thing, the 40 days and nights in the wilderness, but she was talking about all sorts of other mythology and um, Bhagavad Gita and the prodigal son came up at the end, a poem about the prodigal son. Quite a lot has been written about that one, actually. It's a kind of um, easy to misinterpret the prodigal son. It sounds a bit daft. I know Tommy Tiernan, Irish comedian, has elucidated on that one. 
it's like why does this guy get all the good stuff but um interesting talk actually by of all people oh what's his name the director of lock stock and two smoking barrels and snatch etc guy Ritchie on joe rogan podcast talking about first of all he wears nice suits and he was saying how that's part of playing the game and why are men going around dressed like teenagers it's part of me that actually gets that but he also talks about the um prodigal son and the real meaning of it which i didn't plan talking about today but i can just I can see the text flying in already. Everybody, please, please, uh, James, give us your spin on the prodigal son. Okay. It's not my spin, but Guy Ritchie was talking about it. I've seen Richard Rohr and other people write about this as well, but I think there's been a whole book at least written on it. The prodigal son. We are the father. The father is our true dwelling place in our own hearts and we we drift away from that we go out into the world and see i'm going to get it wrong already but we we walk away from our own true calling in life and in our eagerness to taste everything the world has to offer us we lose our way but we also gain knowledge along the way and then we we come back and we're welcome back into the bosom of our own heart I still gotta say though that the guy who stayed the good son I mean not sure that explanation totally kind of helps him out so I don't know I think the motto as Tommy Turnin was alluding to and as most of us thought probably in school when we learned it was, yeah, I think be the prodigal son. Be a, li a little bit prodigal or profligate. That's, that's not the same word at all, is it? But just be a bad boy, a bad girl, and then come back. But no, I think there's certainly a lot to be said for going out into the world and making mistakes. And there's a lot to be said for coming back. Uh, am I back yet? Probably not. Buen Camino. I'm still not sure exactly what or where back is, but I think I've a better idea of it now. I'm 49 and my fantasies are a lot different than I was when I was in my 20s. I was thinking about that today. Nowadays, I fantasize about marrying and having kids. Left that a little late. Actually, have some idea, fantasy about marrying a rich, not rich, but okay, that slipped out. Uh, an English Catholic. I say rich because I'm thinking of the church in South Kensington, Brompton Oratory. Beautiful place. I guess I've been there and I don't know, I guess I saw a lot of these well-dressed Catholics and felt very different to the Catholic church I grew up in. The sermons are kind of different in England. And I think it's, this is my impression, I haven't been to a load of churches there, but I think it's because when we grew up, it was church and state were intertwined and there definitely was a big dose of propaganda. I'm sure Catholic Church in England is not without its problems but it was definitely to be a Catholic there was to hold on to something it was difficult you weren't society wouldn't have encouraged you to hold on it onto it back in the day and uh, it seemed quite serious about the religion and the sermons that I've heard some of them are quite seem quite highbrow compared to what I would have grown up with here. But honestly, I think it's just the part of me that wants to come home, okay, to the, you know, the father or whatever. Maybe that part of me is attracted to some rootedness in tradition, despite all the bad things that went on in the tradition we were brought up with. And then the English bit, 
I think it's just the accent, to be honest. Nice posh English Catholic woman. Oh, hello. Oh, I could listen to that. Maybe it would get tiresome after a while, I don't know. Um, I did bring a posh English lady on a date once. And I was did rather like the way she'd answer the phone and say, Oh, oh, hello, hello. <laughs> so, BK has stopped and he's looking around. He's, no, I think he's checking his map rather than taking a picture. And onwards, okay. So, the English Catholic fantasy, let's park that one. It is kind of amusing. If someone had told me in my 20s, that's the kind of stuff I'd fantasize about, I would say. Oh God, really? So, uh, let me just check my notes here. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna stick with the Old Testament. Plenty of meat to get into there, plenty of meat. So, as we say in the west of Ireland. Um, who took the meat out of these? That's a line from the field film, if anyone has seen it. The Bull McCabe. Who took the meat out of these sandwiches? Uh, not quite nailing the accent there, but doing a better job than most American actors. I have to say, as regards Ir American actors playing Irish, and I'm not hearing great reports about this one that's out now called Wild Irish Time or something, but Christopher Walken and, oh, um, what's her name? Oh God, can't believe I can't remember her name and I'm semi in love with her. <laughs> Um, she, oh my God, Emily. Oh, isn't it? She was in The Devil Wears Prada as the office assistant. Well, I'm, it must be true love. Emily, oh man. God, that's bad. Okay. She's a great actor slash actress, tick is appropriate. I'm trying to keep everyone on board here, the PC Brigade and the uh, my uh, growing right-wing listenership. So, actually, I think my listenership, I would say my listenership is probably in negative numbers now. How does that work? Works like this. There are a number of people actively, angrily not listening to me waking up every day thinking, I'm not gonna to listen to that idiot. But I'm still on their mind. And when things are really bad, they're thinking, well, at least I'm not listening to Camino on a treadmill. So in my own way, I'm spreading a little happiness. I think my best hope is to aim for, like to get my active non-listenership, my negative listenership into the millions. I'm not sure if there's a way to monetize that. Um, Emily, am I wrong with the first name? Emily, I'm just, I can visualize her. She was in Girl on a Train. I love the book, didn't love the film. That often happens. It's part of that, I read a load of those books. Uh, woman in Pearl type books. Woman in Pearl, written by a woman. Uh, probably read by more women than men, but there's some great books in that category. And well, I say I read them, I listened to a lot of them on my, um, on Audible. Apologies to uh, my friends in the book selling business. And I know Audible is owned by Amazon, with all that goes with that, but went through a phase where I couldn't concentrate. And the audiobooks really kind of got me back into, I won't call it reading because that will offend my purist listeners, but uh, yeah, it was good. Um, and all those kind of women in pearl books have blurred into one, I mixed them all up. One of them, oh, something about behind the eyes, what lies behind, what's it, behind those eyes or something, is being made into a film now. 
quite a twist at the end. I think, I like to say I just got the twist just before I came to it, but it's certainly a big twist. Of course, the thing with big, behind those eyes, behind her eyes, wasn't that it? The thing with big twists, there's always a kind of ratio of, you know, size of twist to level of believability. So, and I won't say any more, but that's always a, a thing to deal with. I won't talk any more about my book other than I wrote a certain number of words this morning. Need to do more this evening. Uh, I'm writing my I four week deadlines with an editor in London with an agreement that I can post, I can add an extra week at the end of the deadline if I need to. I'll be doing that. This one, you'd be interested to know. Emily, is that her first name? I started by saying I'm in love with her, and then I was saying, I, I uh, can't remember her name. Um, yeah, I used to, when I, okay, when I say in love with her, no, I'm not obsessed yet. But no, I, I remember liking her in The Devil Wears Prada. And then when Anne Hathaway played the lead in One Day, I love the book, I did not like the film at all. I think that's general consensus. But I actually thought she, this Emily Blunt, there we have it. There we have it, would have been, I remember thinking it before the casting, oh, Emily Blunt would be good for that role. The, the role of Emma, isn't it? I don't know where they went wrong with that film. I know the Dexter character was basically drinking alcoholically and abusing chemicals in a serious way for a big chunk of the book and hoovering down cigarettes. And they had a degree of that in the film, of the drug and drink they alluded towards, you couldn't kind of ditch that. But from my memory, I don't think he smoked at all in the film, which is real PC territory. And by the way, I'm not one of these crazy anti-PCers, but if someone is meant to be, if the character should be smoking, then they should be smoking. And anyone who went through he was involved in that whole ecstasy scene in South London in the, when was it, 90s? Was the book set in the 90s, 2000s? Either way, he was on that scene big time. And of course, from my limited experience, mainly from the sidelines, I wasn't a big E head. Didn't uh, suit me. Uh, always felt, yeah, didn't suit me. And, um, he, uh, most people on that scene were hoovering down Marlboro Lights. Other brands are available. Because I can tell you one thing, drink and substances plus cigarettes, when you're in that kind of zone, they just seem to uh, suit each other. I'm not uh, taking the moral standpoint here, but it just, for me, did not make sense that he wasn't smoking in the film. Correct me if I'm wrong, I'm pretty sure he wasn't. Or if he was, there was very little of it. So, that's that dealt with. And of course, what I really wanted to do today was, well, I'm glad I discovered Emily Blunt's name. Emily, if you're listening, don't worry, I'm not actually in love with you. Just, just in love in that sort of fanboy way. Actually, I hate saying that. I'm not... I don't see myself as a fan when Camino or a fanboy. I don't know. I like films. I like actors. I like female actors, actresses. Um, sometimes I like the way they look. Sometimes I like the way they perform. Sometimes I like both. But I don't tend to get starstruck. I did meet Emily Watson and Robert Carlyle at the Cork Film Festival. 
both of whom I was big fans of at the time, still am. I don't think, you know, I did say something to each of them, but yeah, I, I'm not starstruck. I just don't know what to say always, you know. Met John Prine a couple of times, late John Prine, singer. Met him at a gig in Galway, Campbell's Tavern, for those in the know. He was there two nights in a row, supporting Iris Dement and her husband, whose name, of course, I forget. Two amazing gigs. I mentioned it before here, and I remember him passing me by, and I just, all I could do was pat him on the shoulder. The guy in front of me was just shaking his hand like it was going to fall off and vigorously and saying, I love your music. I love your music. Ah, uh, anyone who knows and likes John Prine, John Prine's music, I would say probably loves it and loves him because I think he really comes across in his music, his persona, and that's not always the case. Then I met him once more in a supermarket in Kinvara in uh, South Galway. Him and his wife had a place there. And uh, just shooting the crap with them, saying, hey, how are you? Yeah, I just flew in the other day. We just flew in the other day and uh, just uh, getting some shopping. Um, you know, just talking to John Prine about regular stuff, that's as good as it gets. Because he talks in his songs about, he's always singing about regular stuff, and yet he can get really deep whilst remaining regular. That ain't easy. Um, that's a real skill that comes, I think, as much from the heart as the mind. He was part Cherokee nation, I think, as well. He had Native American blood in there. Um, oh God, what state was he from? I know we ended up in Illinois. And I'm gonna say, no, <laughs> near, no Kentucky, I nearly said Kansas. You're not in Kansas now, Toto. Kentucky. And uh, you know, the sticks are loud here, BK sticks are loud. But just shooting the crap with John Prine, talking about regular stuff, kind of is as good as it gets. I remember, I've read a few interviews with them and listened to a few. God, he was talking about, like he was kind of half, Buen Camino, he was half discovered by, um, hey, let's just talk about John Prine. I do want to get into a big Old Testament versus Tinder debate because that's really uh, lit a fuse here with my listeners. So let's stay on the John Prine topic. Just going to take some water here. And you read, anytime you read interviews about him, he just comes across as so special. And talking to people like Jason Wilbur, his wonderful guitarist. Oh. I was just looking at Jason Wilbur's solo. He, he's also a singer and in his own right. Don't know his stuff, I have to admit. Next time he comes to Ireland, I gotta check him out. Gotta check out the, uh, some of his music online as well while I'm at it. When I say check it out online, I'll make sure I throw, throw a few dollars his way. Um, harder to buy music now. I, I'm not on Spotify, but I was buying music on, I mean, it's harder to buy digital music. I was buying it on Google Play, which became YouTube Music, and I also uploaded a lot of my bought music on that. But it seems now I can't buy via there. I have to, um, you can just get the subscription thing, and I really, I love um, Bandcamp for supporting kind of smaller musicians because I know they get a bigger chunk of it. So if Jason Wilbur's on Bandcamp, I'll buy him there. But you know what? He's probably got his own website. And if I like it, I'll throw him a few dollars. Any way to get a bigger chunk of the money off. I don't have a lot of money, but the few dollars I give him to make sure he gets most of those um, will be good. And now, of course, I've gone off on a whole other train of thought. 
John Prine. Um, so in many of the interviews I read with me, he'd just say things like, you know what, be writing a song. Oh, okay, first of all, I have to say, he was discovered, or at least one of the earliest people who reviewed him was, and I'm really bad at my name, the names are all eluding me now, the famous Chicago Sun Tribune film reviewer, of course, Roger Ebert. God, I reckon I could um, easily knock a whole hour out of talking about Roger Ebert. And also, out of talking about Francois Truffaut, Buen Camino, and Francois Truffaut's book called The Films of My Life. I much prefer that kind of writing to academic film writing. It's, uh, I love the passion in it, each to their own. <coughs> Why do I bring up academic film writing? I did my, t I spent some time in the academic world, but I was only a mere filmmaker without a PhD. I didn't have all the $10 words, and uh, I only merely knew how to make films, not how to talk about them using $10 words. So you need a PhD to get ahead in that world. But I, you know, I'd much rather write this famous book I'm talking about than do a PhD. And then you get the PhD, and then you just have to work for half the time for free or for peanuts. Just, as, you know, get a fellowship or something, try to work your way up through it. It sounds horrible. I know some good people in that world, but it's not for me. If I'm honest, I kind of respect the sciences more than the arts at the moment. I'm sure there's some notable exceptions. I also found it to be quite a p there's an element of poison in the academic world. I know I've seen people who are deeper entrenched in that talking about it. More poisonous than anything I saw in the film world, to be honest. But I don't know enough. And also, I'm endeavoring to be a herald of joy, to quote Mary O'Hara, but to quote her, one of her favorite theologians. I am a herald of joy. What is, what's the quote? Let us be heralds of joy in the suffering, joyless world. Yeah, I'll do my best. I got my sun lamp on here. Reminds me about the whole concept of herald of joy or beacon of joy. Because the sun was set outside. I got up early, listening to a lot of really good stuff on Radio 4, as I said. Did a bit of writing, then kind of just conked out. Now I'm up again and it's, yeah, my sleep patterns are all over the place. I don't have a wife and kids, I get away with it, but it's not ideal. Let's kind of get back on track here. So let's park the academia for the moment. And back to Roger Ebert discovering John Prine. So Roger Ebert, who at the time was, and for most of his life was, a film reviewer for Chicago Sun-Times, I highly recommend a film about him in his, made in the latter years of his life called Life Itself. It is so beautiful. Such a beautiful, enlightening film. I watched it with my folks a few years ago. They loved it too. And um, there's a book, but I think there's a book as well by Roger Ebert called Life Itself. I'm pretty sure. And must check that out too. Roger Ebert wrote a book, this one I have to get, I think it's out of print. I, I may have mentioned it here in my podcast. I'm probably at the stage now, sorry I just hit my mic there, I'm probably at the stage now where I'm into repeating my 11.5 anecdotes. So there you go. Um, just get some water here. This isn't so much one of my anecdotes, but I uh, get the fan going there. I, uh, <clears throat> Ebert wrote a book about walks in London. He discovered or invented these various walks and trails in London. I have to get that. I love London, but um, that fan is making a weird noise. Hmm. I love London, but I really don't know what to walk around. I know I'm repeating myself again here. 
So uh, I know a lot of it from the tube, little bits by bus, little bits to walk, but there's often places that are close to each other and in my head I don't know that. So I'd love to do his book, but yeah, every time he used to go walking in Hampstead Heath, he'd always come across somebody reading his book. Can you imagine? And I'm definitely repeating myself here. But this is for, this is like from the archives for those who may have missed that episode. From the archives. Um, the reading, imagine reading Roger Ebert's book of walks in London. You're standing on Hampstead Heath and you put down the book and standing in front of you is Roger Ebert. So he discovered John Prine and wrote and John Prine at the time was a mailman, just singing in his spare time in a club in Illinois, in, I think, Chicago. And uh, Ebert gave him a write up. And then Prine, just, I think, pretty quickly started meeting people like Chris Christopherson, Bob Dylan, um, Tom Petty, I think. But just one of the interviews with. Um, Prine, he would say, you know, I'd be writing a song and I'd put a, I'd put an ashtray in it. I'd reference an ashtray because people have ashtrays and they go, oh yeah, I, I relate to that. And it sounds so simple when he says that. It almost sounds too simple, but that's, I think, the appeal of country music or folk music. Uh, country music gets such a bad name in Ireland and everywhere. You know John Prine, they had some country music awards and he wasn't mentioned the year he died in the kind of in memory of bit. A couple of other people weren't mentioned too and a lot of people's noses were out of joint about that. He wasn't corporate enough. And uh, Charlie Pride actually performed at that award ceremony he's since passed away. He'll surely get a mention next time around. Certainly deserves it. I mean, black man in country music, that couldn't have been easy to crack back in the day. So, uh, I know um, Sturgis, oh my God, I don't even know his name. I know he's huge in America, he supported. Is it Sturgis Simpson or something? God, I'm bad on names today. Supported John Prine in Ireland, one of the times I saw him recently. I think I saw John Prine's last gig in Ireland, the National Concert Hall. I could be wrong, but, and the one before that in Galway. Certainly one of the few last ones, but he was really annoyed. A lot of big shots tweeted about that. They were just, you know, no mention of John Prine. Ridiculous. Um, well, I've gone for 33 minutes and I've said nothing of substance. So, par for the course. As I said, we're into negative listenership territory, so hopefully I'll be the first podcaster to discover how to monetize negative listenership. But I think I have to get the negative listenership up to the millions to do that. So, I really should talk slower and I'd actually... I could have made all that content fit an hour. So, but I didn't, so I'll just drink some water instead to buy some time. It's kind of the equivalent of if you're a guest lecturer in a college or a lecturer. Put on a DVD, that's the old trick, isn't it? Put on a DVD, talk a bit, talk a bit of crap, put on a DVD, talk a bit more crap, take some questions and take your money. That's uh, one of the oldest tricks in the books. He's gonna say the oldest profession in the world. He's gonna draw an analogy, but I thought better. Juan Camino. I love the way BK laughs. <laughs> Every time he says Juan Camino, you kind of have to laugh. It's, it's like, what the hell are we doing here? What's Aren't we crazy? Who's crazier, me or him? I'm doing it on a treadmill in Galway. With negative listenership. Okay. I, 
thought I was gonna, I'm gonna up my speed because I really want to get those heart points on my phone. 4.8 kilometers an hour will definitely uh, help that. So, uh, let my arms swing here. Oh yeah, I was thinking for the next one, I might get the sticks. I might get my walking sticks and use them. I don't know how well they'll work in the treadmill. They may cause some issues. Might be a bit of fun. Liven things up, I'll have a stick special. So I'll, I'll flag that, I'll t say today's special episode, including sticks. Should get the negative listenership up a bit. Um, what's there to say about John Bryan? The music speaks for itself. The music speaks for itself. My favorite John Bryan song. Um, like Sam Stone, you kind of, that has to be in, in a list of John Prine songs always. As far as I know, someone told me he plays that at all his gigs. And the few I was at, he played it. And actually Jason Wilbur, his guitarist, I think was also credited as sort of musical arranger or something like that. And I know the gig I saw in Galway, uh, and Galway for him is like coming home. He loves that, and I know he had a connection to um, the Hogan family of Hogan's Bar. And um, I would have known through my folks, John Hogan, who's related to them, who passed away a couple of years ago. So rest in peace, John. I light a virtual candle for you on my virtual Camino. I'll light a real one when I get a chance. And um, so, and rest in peace, John Prine, who of course died from COVID. Uh, he had a good life though, good innings, and he survived quite a few medical travails. So I'd say he would say himself, he did pretty good. And when I heard he had COVID, I thought, yeah, he, um, with all the complications he had, it didn't look good. And I think it's sad the people who got it early on didn't always realize exactly how bad it was. But let's, let's not go there. We're all on this earth for a finite amount of time. And John Prine did so much of value in that finite amount of time. So. Um, I am finding it hard to talk about him. It's easier, I mean, just to come up with things to say because I think people like that, as I said, the music speaks for itself. Don't analyze it. And uh, the impression he gave just to meet him in the flesh. You know, some people like Mary O'Hara, they have that kind of aura, something about them that's real and special. And so many musicians who actually knew him properly would attest to that. But yeah, Jason Wilbur did get some credit as musical director, I think it was. But I know in the gig in Galway, for Sam Stone, it was beautiful. Like, John went off stage for a while, and Sturgis, oh God, is this Sturgis Simpson? I'm so sorry for, I got the name wrong, but he went, he played a few numbers went off. I think John came on, played a few on his own. That's always special, isn't it? But the musicians with him, oh my God. Bass player playing double bass, Juan Camino. Oh, hold on now, we're by a river. Everybody sitting down, having a picnic, Juan Camino. So onward, Christian soldiers. Um, so John comes on, so he does a few numbers on his own. Then he starts singing Sam Stone. Oh, that song. I mean, I've attempted to sing it. I've played it on guitar, but without that lovely finger picking that John does. Someday I'll learn that. Finger picking and a bit of hammer on technique. It's just beautiful. But as I've said before, I heard the chorus line, there's a hole in daddy's arm where all the money goes. 
And Jesus died for nothing, I suppose. It was so beautiful. By the souls who are returning from Nam with the habit and doing his best to fit in in society and not really getting much support. But it's so poetically written and so John starts singing it slowly. And then the bass player creeps onto stage, slowly starts playing the bass with a bow, old style, classical style, I suppose you'd call it. And then Jason Wilbur on guitar. I have a feeling they didn't have a drummer. And I feel really bad saying that if if they did, let me think. Bass, guitar. Oh God, I'd feel awful if I'm wrong. I know for the last song, Danny sang Paradise. What's that one? Take me down to Paradise County. And he always has a thing with that where he plays the guitar or the guitar he wrote it on and he gives that to someone sing along with him and he gave it to his son and that was beautiful especially now in context wasn't that long ago a couple of years well maybe three years two three I don't know and apparently Tom Waits I think has got up on stage and sung with him I know Roger Waters has like <laughs> it really touches me to think of this when John Prine because I've read this when he plays at gigs they all want to play with them. And these would be musicians, like say, not every Roger Waters fan. Okay, I'm a bit more Dave Gilmore fan than Roger Waters when Camino, but anyway, that's by the by. But not every Roger Waters fan would necessarily know who John Prine is. But I think any musician who's been around for a while and who appreciates good songwriting would know who John Prine is, and they all wanted to sing with him. Here we go, some more Korean. I'm not translating anymore. Um, my union won't let me. Translators' union of the world. I can just say they're um, exchanging pleasantries. That's all I'm allowed to say. But it's all good, all good. So. Nice to hear another language in between my nonsense. Oh, what, what do I mean nonsense? In between my, my musings. That's a good one. Musings covers a multitude of sins. That's a great name for a novel. A multitude of sins must exist already. Involving corrupt Catholic priests. I don't know, satanic pacts or something subtle like that. So. Mm. More water. I've only 17 minutes left. And that arrangement of Sam Stone was so beautifully done. But yeah, I was... Oh, hold on, we got some more Korean going on. I wish I was allowed to translate it for you. This is quite interesting. No, I couldn't. I'm not going to tell you what he's saying, but they're saying... Quite amusing though. Little did they know this would be listened into by and talked about by a young, well, middle-aged, handsome Irish man on his treadmill in Galway, Ireland. See, you never know what lies ahead. As I said, all joking aside, the only Korean I know is Anyo which is hi or bye. Gomsahamnida. Thank you. Oma, mother. Opa, father. And that's it. Um, John Prine. Jason Wilbur, yeah. So my friend Matthew was over, we were jamming. I was showing him my new Fender Telecaster guitar, which of course he proceeded to play much better than me. 
making me hashtag jealous. But there you go. What can you do with the old hashtag jealousy? Except uh, hashtag quietly fume or hashtag do a podcast and talk about it there. Let off some steam. I'd say Matthew has more natural talent than me and also critically practiced more than me. I mean, that's always at the heart of it. They talk about what's a 5% inspiration, 95% perspiration. Don't know if the numbers are quite right, but it has, there's a lot of truth in that. So Jason Wilbur. So yeah, I was showing Matthew though a video of John Prine, all oh, this lovely song he does. And what's the name of it? But it's like the chorus. His, his turn of phrase is so wonderful. But so sometimes broken bottles, bro, look just, sometimes a broken bottle looks just like a diamond ring. <sighs> See, there he is just getting the most prosaic of images and then juxtaposing it with something else and creating pure poetry out of it and making it seem simple and easy, which it ain't. Um, but then, and this was a recording, must be a good while ago, Jason Wilbur, looking quite young and fresh. And the solo he played was just so subtle and so beautiful. And that's the real talent. And a lot of those Nashville guys, they really have that. You know, he had, he used one pedal. It was a, I think, I think it was a Nashville guitar, which is sort of like a, Fender, uh, like a Telecaster with middle pickup. <laughs> I'm sure. Just trying to keep the fan base on board, my guitar fans out there. Um, and uh, he had one pedal. You could see him pressing the pedal, but it was probably just one of those booster pedals that just you press it. Actually, I ordered one. I haven't even used it, but you press it for the solo to get that boost. But it's not like. You know, the Nashville guys don't go in for all the distortion pedals, wah-wah, chorus, all this delay to a big degree. And nothing wrong with it, if it's used well. I quote, uh, witness um, Pink Floyd, some amazing use of delay, the wonderful David Gilmore. But the Nashville guys, it's just such a subtle solo. It's got the subtlety of a great, classical musician to me. And again, they're making it look easy. But uh, to play that well and that cleanly, that really applies an electric guitar, clean playing, something I'm struggling with. So it looks like I'm managing to somehow talk, stay on the John Prine topic, but not getting anywhere close to explaining how special he was. But you don't need to listen to me. If you've never heard of him, if you've heard of him, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you haven't, check him out. And hey, why not check out Jason Wilbur while you're at it? I'm gonna do that too. Oh yeah, so when I saw John Prine though that time in Galway, when he did Paradise, at the end, he handed the guitar to his son. I think I said that already. And, uh, Josh, I think his name was, isn't it? I bought a t-shirt off his son in the interval. Let's hope we see some more of him. And uh, carrying the lantern, or the, is that the phrase? Carrying the flame. I hope they're all doing well, Prime family. I'd love to, I'd love to bump into them sometime in Kinvara, which might, may happen not to bother them too much, just to say, as so many thousands of people would say to them, you know, how much I love John. I always know I'm in a good space when I'm listening to John Prine. Iris Dement too, I haven't listened to her in a while. So I've got 10 minutes to go. I'm looking at my notes. I've got a note here, peeing in the dark room. Why don't I finish with 
uh, one of my anecdotes that I haven't used yet. It doesn't really involve me, but... So I worked at this film company when I was starting off in my 20s, and we were making cheesy um, American films shot in Ireland, which was quite amusing. We got a walk-on line in one of them. My line was, Sir, he's here. Yeah, I'm still, I still got it. And, uh, Sir, he's here. Do you hear that pause? It's all in the pause, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Imagine I'm able to just, like, tap into it all these years later. First of all, I still remember my line. Secondly, I can just, I'm just like in character, just like that. And then I can step back out and be the philosophical, um, it is back into my philosophical musings. And then in an instant, sir, he's here. Okay, you may notice a subtle difference in each take. I always like to give that to my directors. Uh, I'll always get my, I'll hit my lines, I'll hit, I'll hit my marks, I'll hit my lines, I'll get my lines right, but I'll always just give a nuance of difference in each one. And I, they're all perfect, but they have a little hint of variety in each one that they can pick. I would have gone for, actually take one there, I think was the best, but then I just gave it. I'm not, I don't want to give away too many secrets here. Let's, let's uh, move on. So, uh, uh, no, I'm not doing it for it to take. Um, but there was an anecdote during the rounds, well, a true story about, uh, you know what, I gotta put my speed down. I'm at 4.8, I'm at 4.6, and I'm taking some more water. Okay, so, the cameraman, who shall remain unnamed, just, and I knew um, two of the guys I was sharing with, my house with, were in the camera department. And um, this cameraman, apparently, so we had a dark room. You, you have a camera truck with a dark room in the back of it where they could load up the film cartridges. Back then, it was all shot on. 35 millimeter film. It's before a video, a digital video really came to the fore. And uh, anyway, apparently said cameraman went into the dark room and took a leak. And so the story was going around that people were saying, yeah, he peed in the dark room. I mean, the language was a little more choice than that. And I was like, I was just blown away by it. I was like, and they were telling it kind of casually and laughing about it, but it's, you know, one of these things where you pick up a story wrong, you get the wrong image in your head. And it took me years to correct that image, because when they said he peed in the dark room, my understanding was he went into the dark room, unzipped, you know, whipped it out and let loose. And I was like, that is insane. Buen Camino. Oh, cyclist, get a bell, ding ding. Going the wrong way as well. So, um, I was just like, I mean, they all thought it was funny and a little out there, but I was, my mind was blown. I'm like, how could he even keep his job? And of course, I mean, you've already probably picked up on it. Years later, somebody was explaining, and I must have stopped them and said, no, just let me get this straight. What they meant was, they left out a vital detail in the story. See, I'd never do that. I'm a good storyteller. I'd get all the props in there first. So he went in and peed into a bottle or something, a receptacle, shall we say. Now that is a totally different story. It's still out there. Personally, I don't even think it's that crazy. It's like, hey, you gotta go, right? Oh, more Korean. Is he with? Korean people all the time. If so, they're quiet most of the time. Anyway, that's my peeing in the dark room anecdote. But what, you know, what a different story. I mean, the way I first envisioned the story was more dramatic, definitely grosser, 
But uh, now it all adds up. Find Camino, get a bell. Bloody cyclists, there's a lot more of them to come. Uh, they still irk me. There's a verb for you, irk. It's not one you, you use a lot. They irk me. It doesn't even sound right. You know some of those words, well, especially the big ones, those words that you read but rarely ever say, then you say them and you're like, am I pronouncing it right? Here's one, febrile or febrile. It's febrile, isn't it? I think so. We we'll never know. Um, I thought I'd get the peeing in the darkroom story would get me to the end of this walk. It clearly has failed to live up to its promise. And I'm not going back to talking about John Prine after that, although he could have written a song about that, probably. Anyway, uh, another note about fig rolls. I must maligned biscuit. They're actually, I don't buy them because I'm trying to be good, but I think they're a great biscuit. If you do get fig rolls, oh, here's another thing. The big question of the day, are there fig rolls in America? We have them in Ireland and the UK. Now, the most popular one in Ireland would have been Jacob's, which are pretty good. But the McVitie's ones, and they only appeared here in the last few years, are by far the best. Just like it says on the cover, they've got like 30% more fig or something, and oh. Oh God, I'm thinking about them now. I have a dreadful feeling I'll go to the shop and buy a pack of them after this. And why not? Actually, they'd be great Camino food. So it's basically just the fig, fig wrapped in, you know, pastry or biscuit or whatever. And yes, McVitie's. Other brands are available, but really, McVitie's, if you want to sponsor me. Oh yeah, I was told by the podcast provider I had to tick different things. I said, there's no swearing, but it's a reference to drug use. And I had to tick there was, and then I said, you know, it's, it's certainly not condoning it. It's, it's more to do with anecdotes from my past, because I don't, the anecdotes from one's youth that involve use of certain illicit things by oneself or others, some of them are amusing. And I know that heavy, drug use, especially the, you know, the hard stuff. There's nothing at all amusing about that, but hey, I'm not gonna get po-faced. Um, but yeah, they got back said, oh, we don't think we can get you a sponsor. I mean, I didn't, I wasn't looking for one. It's just they automatically kind of do that. Or maybe I, I must have clicked a box and get me a sponsor. <laughs> but, even imagine if I did have one for this, and then I'd have to suddenly take loads of boxes. No, I'm too way out there for that. I'm a maverick. Uh, anyway, as I said, I'm going for negative listenership. I don't think sponsors are, would be interested in that. We're coming into where is this place? Some little town. It's not Pamplona. Is it the town I spent my? second night with the crazy shopkeeper who said you need to relax um, or have we passed that already we never know oh god I gotta stop saying that okay anyway I have got oh two minutes to go so I can start wrapping up I'll definitely get back to the Old Testament versus, oh, dating in Old Testament times, yeah, versus Tinder tomorrow. Also, maybe starting with Adam and Eve, you know, I don't think the market for Tinder would have been so great for Adam and Eve or for Happen or any of these sites to be discussed tomorrow. So uh, you know where to be tomorrow, tune in. Same bat time, same bat channel. As they used to say on the old bat, Batman TV show. Oh, I used to enjoy that. Got a lot more serious since then, the whole Batman story. 
dark night and all that. So, is BK dragging his sticks there? I don't know. Uh, it's getting noisy. So how are we doing here? So yeah, like I said, 30 seconds to go. Uh, I still have to talk one of the days about David Bowie. I don't even know much about him, but somehow I've been thinking about him lately. And what else? Uh, dating in the Old Testament. That should be fun. And uh, ayahuasca. Oh yeah, we'll talk about that someday. If you don't know what it is, Google it. Ayahuasca. A-Y-A-H-U-A-S-C-A, -A -A -A, I think. I uh, definitely won't get any sponsors talking about that. Okay, I've hit two hours. Over and out, hope you enjoyed. And uh, Buen Camino, God bless. See you soon.